virtual meeting. We are uh, trying to do a bit of both this year you know, after being virtual for the last two years, trying to get back to some in-person meetings, but um, also wanting to reach out, be able to reach our wider community, whole country. Um, we've had people from all over the world join us in our virtual meetings. So um, I'm glad we're able to still continue with that. Um, let's see, I just wanna share my screen. Hmm. Well, I was going to share my screen and it does not seem to be showing the correct thing. So I guess I will not share my screen. Um, but I uh, wanted to uh, just make a quick announcement that um, anyone who's interested in um, sponsoring the Washington Conservation Guild. We have kind of a new tiered sponsorship levels um, that if you want to get your name up on our website or um, out on our social media, um, if you want to have your logo projected at the meetings, which I was hoping I was going to do, but unfortunately screen sharing is not letting me do that. I wanted to uh, project some logos to say thank you to the Smithsonian National Collections Program. They sponsor our three ring circus every year. And also a big thank you to University Products, who's one of our newer sponsors. Um, you can get in touch with us if you would like to become a sponsor uh, and get your name up on our website. Um, and then I also wanted to announce the uh, Wilston Fund recipients. We have uh, five emerging professionals, Morgan Brown, Jones Kelly, Kelsey Marino, Emily Mercer, and Catherine Miramonti. Um, so big congratulations to them. They are going to be receiving um, funding towards uh, AIC membership and will be getting to do a little um, helping out with some of the WCG administration. Um, so, and probably pre presenting some of their work later in the season. So we'll get a chance to do from them this spring and see them around at all of our meetings. Um, that's uh, it from me. So I'm going to hand it over to one of our WCG's uh, meeting directors, Nick Pedamonti. Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending uh, tonight's uh, event and speaker. Um, we have with us is uh, Shauna Daniel and Kate Moran. Um, Kate will be uh, speaking uh, first, and then Shana will be following up with a tour. Um, by way of introductions, uh, Shana Daniel was born and raised in Longview, Texas. Her archaeological conservation experience uh, has involved the Anthropology Archaeological, Archaeological Program at Stephen F. Austin State University and working with various CRM companies. Her education and experience continued at Texas A&M in the Anthrope Department, where she worked at uh, the Conservation Research Laboratory, CRL. After receiving her master's in anthropology at Texas A&M University, with an emphasis in artifact conservation, she worked as an archeological conservator with the Queen Anne's Revenge, QAR, Conservation Laboratory in Greenville, North Carolina. Her responsibilities included field conservation, in-situ monitoring, expertiography, concretion breakdown, solution testing, and the conservation of organic and inorganic artifacts. After six years at the QAR lab, she began working for Search Inc. as a curatorial specialist maritime conservator, mainly working as a contractor for the Naval History and Heritage Command, NHHC, Underwater Archaeology, the UA branch. This led Shauna to become a full-time employee at NH NHHC as their lead archaeological conservator, tasked with overseeing of the conservation projects, curation of Navy archaeological material, and public outreach. And in her spare time, Shauna enjoys reading, ballroom dancing, and gardening. We have Kate Moran, who will be speaking with us as soon as I'm done. And Kate Moran serves as the director of the Naval History and Heritage Command, NHHC, Conservation Research and Archaeological Laboratory, Laboratory Coral. Is that correct, Kate? I think so. A, or Coral, I don't know. A component of the NHHC Underwater Archaeology Branch. She received her post-baccalaureate uh, degree in fine art and archaeological conservation at the Studio Art Centers International in Florence. 
and supported conservation projects at the superintendents of Tuscany and Malta. Coral is responsible for the documentation, research, conservation, and preservation of archaeological materials recovered from more than 23,000 sunken and terrestrial military craft, SMC or TMC for short, under Department of Navy purview. Coral also serves as a curation facility for nearly 20,000 archaeological artifacts recovered from SMC TMC. Coordinates, uh, coordinates loans of archaeological material, conducts artifact analysis and research, and undertakes education and outreach efforts. And in, in, in Kate's spare time, she enjoys true, time, true crime podcasts, traveling, and cheering on the Kansas City Chiefs. So without further ado, Kate, take it away. Thank you so much. Let me now see if I can share my screen properly. Is everyone able to see? Can you give me a thumbs up, maybe, Nick? Yes, we can see this. Okay, awesome, perfect. Okay, well, thanks so much. Um, uh, we'd like to certainly thank Washington Conservation Guild for this opportunity, um, especially Kira Teeter, who reached out to us in the first place, and for and to Nick also for <laughs> helping us get all our ducks in a row um, to uh, be here this evening. Um, but we're very pleased to be able to share uh, our organization, our mission, our work, and our lab with this uh, great community of conservators. And we hope to get to know more of you as, as we carry on. Um, but uh, the title of this presentation is the NHHC UA Conservation Research and Archaeology Laboratory, CORAL for short. Uh, the military does love its acronyms, uh, and uh, basically uh, treating archaeological art artifacts from U.S. Navy sunken military craft. So I'd like to give a, a brief background um, on, on the Naval History and Heritage Command, just to give some more context to uh, the work that we do in the laboratory. Um, but the Naval History and Heritage Command is um, <clears throat> an Echelon II command um, under the Department of the Navy. Uh, the headquarters is located on the Washington Navy Yard in Southeast DC. Uh, it's a really beautiful historical property. If anyone uh, manages to come down and visit, it's, it's a really beautiful place. Um, however, there are other um, components of, of the command sprinkled throughout the country. Um, but the command's primary mission is <clears throat> to preserve and present an accurate history of the U.S. Navy um, and the primary components that allow us to do this are through the uh, collections in the Navy's department library, uh, Navy's archives, uh, nine Navy museums around the country, uh, two historic ships including USS Constitution uh, up at Detail Boston, and USS Nautilus in Groton, Connecticut. Uh, Navy's historical artifact collection, which is located both at uh, NHHC HQ in DC and at our collections management facility in Richmond, Virginia. I'll also take this opportunity to give um, our colleagues uh, down in Richmond, Virginia a shout out. Um, Conservation Branch is another entity of the command uh, that is, is tasked exclusively with uh, supporting uh, treatment of the historical artifact collection and supporting the Navy museums, as well as uh, doing research and supporting training as well. Um, our conservation lab is, is attached to the underwater archaeology branch, but we are, we are uh, great conservation colleagues and I did want to give them a shout out as well. Uh, and then Navy's art collection also, which is, is located at NHHC HQ. Um, so since the collections under NHHC purview are public resources. Our customers, you know, in receipt of, of this history are, of course, the American public and active duty and retired military um, with a focus on our active duty sailors. So the underwater archeology span branch uh, supports the command's uh, mission um, with, with our branch mission, which is 
uh, essentially to preserve and present the story of the United States Navy through managing, researching, interpreting, and caring for the department's worldwide distribution of more than 18,000 sunken and terrestrial military craft. Um, you'll see this abbreviated as SMCTMC in the document. So that's what that acronym refers to. Um, we have really four key functions. Um, the first is sunken and terrestrial military craft management, which includes policy development, uh, running our permitting program, maintaining and augmenting an arch ARC GIS database of uh, sunken and terrestrial military craft locations. Uh, second function is archaeological research. This may be internally or externally driven. Um, it includes documentation, identification, investigation of SMC, TMC uh, in pursuit of specific research questions. Uh, conservation and curation is another key function, which I'll talk about in greater detail. And lastly, uh, public outreach, um, which in includes uh, an internship program, which we're, we're particularly proud of, um, attending conferences, lectures, presentations, giving lab tours, and maintaining a social media presence. Uh, so this evening serves as part of our <laughs> part of our, our mission. So thank you all for for helping us with our mission uh, as we proceed through here. Uh, and then just to offer a bit of um, information about the scope of sunken and terrestrial military craft for those who might not be aware, um, this map shows uh, the approximate locations of about 3,000 shipwrecks. Um, and as you can see, they're, they're sprinkled pretty heavily around internationally. Um, the the uh, indicators on this map are our only shipwrecks. We have also approximately 15,000 plus aircraft wrecks um, that are not depicted here. And if they were, it'd be very hard to decipher, <laughs> decipher the map very clearly. Um, but we do estimate that there are probably another 20,000 plus unaccounted for uh, sites that, that you know, we'll need to continue to move forward to try to identify. So just to give a sense of, of the scope here, uh, and we are eight full-time employees. Um, but the losses here uh, span from the uh, earliest days of, of the United States Navy, so the American Revolution, to the nuclear age. Um, approximately, uh, there's a, about a 60-40 split of, of where the sites are located, with about 60% being located in US territorial waters, and another 40% located uh, in international or foreign waters. And just a bit about um, the complexity of, of a lot of these sites of, of sunken and terrestrial military craft. Uh, NHHC is responsible for the management of craft and associated contents, which includes artifacts, uh, human remains, and personal effects. Um, in addition to their historical and cultural value, these sites often serve as maritime grave sites. They may <clears throat> present environmental concerns, such as leaking oil. Um, they can uh, present public safety hazards, and most often this takes the form of unexploded ordnance, which you can see on the bottom left photograph there, often, often a, a topic of conversation when we investigate sunken military craft. There can also be sensitive materials aboard some of these, some of these sites, uh, sensitive data, sensitive technology, and, uh, and of course, um, as, as you saw in the previous graphic, there are many, many sites that, that um, are located um, outside of the continental United States, and such uh, interactions um, to, to manage these sites often uh, involve coordination at a higher level of, of government, usually at the State Department level or um, at the upper uh, big Navy level, essentially. So those conversations happen um, between, between larger entities uh, that, that are required sometimes to, to um, manage those sites in, in foreign waters. But essentially, um, these sites are fragile, non-renewable, and multifaceted resources, each requiring an individualized management approach. It's very rare that one size fits all when it comes to managing some military craft. So um, a bit more information about um, 
scientific research and analysis that is performed by the branch, um, which occasionally our conservation staff uh, do participate in. Um, but uh, we, we maintain a permitting program, which allows uh, third parties to investigate some military craft and um, uh, disturb the site uh, for very specific purposes, usually research or education based. Um, our investigations of sunken military craft can be internally driven. Um, we partner with other federal agencies, other state agencies, universities as well um, to investigate sunken military craft. Um, uh, some of these um, investigations are non-intrusive, um, more about identification and documentation and remote sensing. Um, but then we can also have uh, more in-depth excavation and artifact recovery, which is usually where the conservation staff comes in. Um, and the artifact collection that we, we currently uh, curate represents approximately 44 um, sites. And I'll touch once more briefly on our education and outreach function, um, mostly just to promote our internship program. Um, my colleague Shauna is, is uh, in charge of overseeing our laboratory interns. She's a really great mentor. <laughs> and uh, uh, our internship program, again, we're very proud of it. It, it um, helps us accomplish uh, a good chunk of our mission that we otherwise wouldn't be able to. Um, so if anyone uh, uh, on, the, on the meeting might be interested in interning or know someone who might be interested in interning, please do reach out. It's probably impossible that we won't be able to find a project for you. So, um, but again, um, education and outreach is, is a large component of our function um, and does, does help us uh, to achieve our mission. Um, we try to participate as much as we can in um, conversations about sunken military craft and um, do research and publish and, and, and try to engage the public in multiple different methods. And with that, I will move into the conservation and curation function. Um, the lab itself, CORAL, is responsible for document, documentation, conservation, curation, and preservation of Navy's archaeological artifact collection. At present, um, we have an educated estimate of about 20,000 archaeological objects um, that are under our purview. We have approximately 250 artifacts in multiple stages of treatment. Um, we have a uh, on-site curated collection of artifacts of 36, about 3,600 pieces, about 6,500 artifacts on loan to approximately 17 loan institutions. And to give a bit more information about the archeological collection uh, itself, um, the collection includes artifacts recovered from approximately 44 sites, again, dating to about the late 18th century, the American Revolution to approximately 1956. Uh, the collection is composed of um, artifacts that were recovered via authorized and unauthorized means. In our experience, the artifacts that come to us uh, as a result of unauthorized recoveries tend to be quite a bit more fragile and, and require quite a bit more work. Um, and uh, uh, also, however, you can um, uh, get, get different amounts of, of artifacts. Um, for example, we have authorized recoveries that are, are actually performed by the Army Corps of Engineers in which most recently we've had two very large influxes of artifacts come in, um, several thousand pieces from USS Westfield and CSS Alabama. Those were uh, Civil War shipwrecks um, that were fully recovered um, as a result of mitigation um, by Army Corps uh, as they were doing a, a dredging as they were doing dredging projects. So uh, very quickly, um, our collection can our collection can grow very quickly and, and exponentially, um, and it's uh, you know because. Of, uh, due to the nature of DOD owning the cultural resources, this sometimes means that we do have less control over our collection growth and 
uh, it is a little uh, more difficult to predict collection growth over, <laughs> over a certain period of time. Um, and uh, like most curation facilities, space is always a concern. So uh, that's always a fun challenge. Um, but we also have uh, macro artifacts, ship components, um, uh, and things like that that do require special handling and, um, and other special needs. Um, and I'll also mention uh, 36 CFR Part 79, um, the federal regulations, because the this is a federally owned and administered archaeological collection. We are also subject to um, those regulations in our, in our efforts uh, to conserve and curate the collection. Um, I'll just briefly point out a couple of these photographs. On the top left, you can see a piece of unexploded ordnance. Well, it's actually been inerted at this point, um, but it's a, essentially a round shell from CSS Alabama. Um, CSS Alabama was the first uh, shipwreck that the lab was tasked with, with conserving. And in fact, the reason that the lab was, um, was formed in 1996. Um, so we have a considerable number of artifacts from that collection. Uh, this is also a piece of, of ordnance, um, which we do have to uh, work with uh, explosive ordnance disposal units to render inert without completely destroying it. Um, but also a complex object, lots of different materials. Um, on the top right, uh, you can see some, some human remains there. Um, the, it's less common for us to, to have possession of human remains. It's, it's not something we, we uh, uh, seek to do, but occasionally um, these, these came to us a few years ago as a result of an unauthorized recovery. Um, and we are presently working with the um, National Museum of Health and Medicine and the University of Wisconsin um, to try and identify um, whether uh, we might be able to identify these individuals. So some interesting things come through our door. Um, and then the, uh, the image on the bottom, which I'll, I'll talk about in a bit more detail, is one of our more interesting artifacts, has pretty interesting story. Um, and is also a macro artifact. It's a it's a late nineteenth century uh, steam powered torpedo. In a little bit more detail, but I did want to highlight one one artifact, um, mostly just in case, <laughs> on the historical navy yard, if we happen to lose our our internet connection, which is known to happen, uh, that that you guys would be able to see at least one artifact um, that that has gone through conservation, but. Um, uh, this artifact is, is pretty unique. It came to us in uh, 2013, uh, and it was actually discovered off the coast of San Diego, California, by a team of dolphins, part, part of the Navy's marine mammal program. Um, the dolphins were performing an underwater object location and marking training evolution. Um, they are specially trained to, to perform a number of tasks, and in this particular area, the trainers were surprised because the dolphins were indicating that they had in fact found a target that they were not supposed to find. Um, the, uh, the trainers sent down divers who investigated uh, the site and recovered the middle body and after body sections of a Howell Mark I torpedo. And this ended up being uh, torpedo number 24. You can see the mark on the lower left image. Um, but uh, we got a very interesting phone call <laughs> from the Navy's Marine Mammal Program telling us that they had in fact found this, this artifact and, and how, how they could get it to us. Um, so in fact, uh, the, the Marine Mammal Program was able to uh, submerge these in water uh, temporarily. And then actually um, these were flown to NHH, well, they were flown to Washington DC on a C-130 transport aircraft and then transported to the conservation lab at NHC headquarters, um, where we started the documentation process and learned as much as we possibly could about late 19th century steam powered torpedoes. Um, but uh, luckily, one of the perks of, of having the Navy's archives uh, in such close proximity is that we were able to locate uh, the original manual for this weapon. It was a, a Navy designed, Navy produced weapon. So the library actually had a, a manual from 1896 printed by the Naval Torpedo Station, which became our Bible. 
Um, and a lot of these schematics here, uh, you can see, um, are, are uh, taken from, from this manual. Uh, and so as we started to, uh, to look at all the different components and use the manual to identify what we had and uh, look at all the different materials, we started also piecing together um, some information about how this, this strange artifact ended up where it did off the coast of California. Um, but uh, you can see the middle and after body uh, at the center of the screen there, and then uh, a full uh, side view of what the complete torpedo would have looked like. Um, there was no uh, nose cone. You can see there would have been originally a nose cone uh, attached to the, the front end of the middle body. Uh, it was not in the immediate area, um, but uh, uh, would be kind of fun to try to go back out and see if we can find it. So maybe. <laughs> Um, but we did note uh, several features. Um, there, there was still present um, a 130 pound steel flywheel in the middle body, um, what appeared to be depth register canister, uh, a calcium phosphide canister, which is the image on the sort of the bottom center. Um, that led us to determine that this was likely a training torpedo. Uh, the holes that you can kind of see punctured down in the bottom there um, indicate that uh, this calcium phosphide canister was used um, and the calcium phosphide canisters were uh, essentially inserted into this cavity in the middle body. Um, and as the torpedo was deployed, seawater would come into contact with the chemical through these holes that were punched and um, it would produce a gas, which uh, when floated to the surface uh, would, would sort of leave a trail of white smoke, which the, the ship could then follow. Uh, and then retrieve the torpedo once it had finished its run. Um, and it was able to go about uh, 25 knots max speed for about 400 yards, which was pretty good for the late 19th century. But it also has um, copper elements, steel elements, aluminum bronze, um, uh, rubber seals, um, oil and braided cotton wicking possibly. Um, all kinds of interesting materials. So as I mentioned, we started uh, looking into how it could be that this artifact ended off the, up off the coast of California. Um, you see Lieutenant Commander Howell there in the, the portrait on the left. Um, he actually designed this uh, automobile torpedo as it was called. Um, in 1889, um, 50, of these uh, torpedo models, Mark I torpedo models, were ordered uh, from Hotchkiss Ordnance Company um, after Congress had appropriated the funds to do so. And then in 1895, the Navy received all 50 of those test torpedoes. Uh, and then a couple, a couple years later, uh, eight ships received uh, torpedoes to use and test. And so we actually had our interns uh, go through and check uh, uh, the Secretary of the Navy annual reports to see which vessels actually received HAL torpedoes and which of those vessels spent time off the coast of California. Uh, and eventually one of our interns identified that uh, USS Iowa was one of the ships that received HAL torpedoes. And in the logbook, which you can see uh, in the top right image, um, she started looking through and essentially uh, discovered that uh, in, on December 20th, 1899, uh, someone Ensign had entered target practice with torpedoes, lost H Mark I number 24 torpedo. So that was kind of an exciting discovery and uh, led to um, kind of a richer understanding of, of the history of, of number 24. Uh, and then when it came to treatment, um, we were able to uh, contract Terra Mari Conservation, uh, which is co-led by Claudia Camello and Paul Mardikian uh, to come in and uh, develop treatment plans with us and, and work on uh, stabilizing this artifact. Um, it, was, it was a tall order. These are quite complex objects. Um, we started with partial disassembly and deconcretion of uh, sea life and, and um, corrosion products. Um, the middle body, uh, which you can see on the left side there, was actually full of sediment. And so we 
actually had a mini archaeological investigation and slowly excavated uh, in 10 centimeter slices, uh, these bits of sediment, we screened it for small artifacts and, and were able to pull out a, a few small interesting pieces. Um, then uh, desalination uh, was sort of the, the main order of the day. Um, it, these solutions were mostly 3% sodium carbonate. Um, and toward the end of treatment, um, both the middle and after body uh, were placed into sodium alkyl sulfate at 0.1%. And then the middle body um, actually underwent uh, electrolysis uh, to, to encourage chloride removal from the flywheel. Um, and at the very end of treatment, uh, you can see in the center photo, um, we actually uh, performed electrol very localized electrolysis on the flywheel um, in sodium hydroxide. Um, the top um, part of the um, middle body you can see sticking out of the barrel there is is essentially the the end that has the rubber gasket that we didn't want to um, get damaged by being in the hydroxide so it's a, an interesting treatment but um, worked quite well we were able to pull out most of of the um, soluble salts within very happy with the end uh, parts per million I think it was well below 20 parts per million um, there was a controlled drying process using infrared lights. Uh, tannic acid was applied to the flywheel. Um, and then as far as finishing, there was a 5% solution of paraloy B48 applied to the surfaces on the middle body. Um, Cortec VPCI316 was also applied on the surfaces of the after body. And then surface finishing with bronze wool and 20% antique bronze M20 cold patina. Um, was performed and um, we were very pleased with the end result. We have a pretty stable um, couple of artifacts and the images on the right actually show them on display at the Naval Undersea Museum in Keyport, Washington, which is really where we, we hope that most of our objects end up again trying to, to bring the collection to the public uh, and we're told that it's a, it's a pretty popular exhibit. So we're thrilled that um, this project could, could have a really exciting ending like this. And uh, for the last part of my presentation, I'll just um, note that um, a few updates on our, our uh, conservation and curation facilities. Um, we have uh, been uh, temporary dis temp temporarily displaced from our original location. We're actually uh, in the temporary space at the moment, but um, here you can see uh, the historical buildings in the Washington Navy Yard in the top left corner is building 4667, uh, which is, uh, was a huge open warehouse. Uh, the bottom center photo kind of shows you the, the vastness inside there, but um, this is a historical structure. It was built in the 1880s. It lived many lives before it housed Navy's underwater archeology span lab and artifact collection. Um, the two photos on the right are, are from about uh, 2009, 2008, and show kind of the earliest um, spaces of the, of the archaeology lab and uh, the collection spaces there. Um, in 2019, there was an uh, effort to, to move forward with renovation of 4667 um, and place most of the Naval History and Heritage Command's uh, uh, library and archives, um, fine art, and then underwater archaeology uh, into the building, thereby reducing our footprint on the on the Navy Yard as, at large. Um, so that moved forward, and in 2020 we moved out of 4667 and into this temporary lab space, still on the Washington Navy Yard. Uh, we'll show you it in just a moment as uh, Shauna gives us a lab tour. Um, but uh, it's, it's been really great to, to have a temporary space to work. And thankfully we haven't had really too much interruption to our, our work um, while the renovation is happening. Um, there was uh, some adjustment to, to the facility made so that we could utilize it. And it's, uh, it's been a nice home for the last few years. Uh, the image on the right shows the artifact collection, which was uh, containered um, for the majority of the renovation project. You can see it all crated up. Uh, this is only a small, a small view of it, but um, it unfortunately was 
uh, closed to the public um, while the renovation was happening, but uh, we're really hoping uh, we can get it back into our collection spaces and a bit more available for people. And with that, these final photos are of uh, the renovated collection uh, curation and uh, conservation spaces in 4667, which we're hoping to move back into in January or February of 2023, fingers crossed. Um, the new spaces include approximately 1900 square feet of collection space, about 1200 square feet of lab space, and about a thousand square feet of macro artifact treatment space, uh, updated HVACs for each space, a five ton bridge crane, clean agent fire suppression systems for the collection spaces, and for the underwater archaeology branch, um, dedicated spaces for a loading dock and chemical storage, uh, dive locker, and remote sensing operations as well. So we're really looking forward to moving in and maybe welcoming some of you for an in-person tour at some point. Um, but with that, um, I'll just put our contact information up. Uh, if anyone has any questions or would like to reach out, um, we'd you know, love to meet uh, more conservators. So um, happy to, happy to uh, connect and, and uh, um, share thoughts and welcome people for tours. So please uh, don't hesitate to reach out if you're interested in any of what we talked about tonight. But uh, with that, um, I will stop sharing. And we can start with the virtual tour. Nick, is it okay to move on to the next? Yeah, let's do that. All right, stand by. Forgive the angle. All right, I present Ms. Shauna Daniel for the remainder of the tour. <laughs> yes. uh, I think you're good. Okay, I am. I don't good. know why. Uh, so, hello, greetings, everyone. Uh, I know that uh, Kate gave you a great overview of what we do here and some of the projects that we've been uh, successful with. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about what we're doing right now here in the lab. And I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of some of the artifacts um, and the sites that they're coming from. The first one we're going to look at is from the Moro Savage. Uh, this is a Revolutionary War uh, shipwreck that went down during the Battle of Brockville Bay. Uh, this was around November of 1776, and it was quite an interesting thing. It was built by the British. Uh, again, during a particular battle, it sank. The uh, colonial forces actually brought it back up and recovered it and got it uh, working again and named it Royal Savage. Then during that battle, it actually was burned and uh, by the British. So we would not be able to use it again. Uh, going forward a little bit, uh, back in 19, about 1930s, a uh, gentleman, um, Mr. Haglin, uh, actually uh, was able to uh, lift up the Royal Savage from uh, its depths in the uh, Lake Champlain area. And during that time, he the whole vessel came up. Uh, he was able to float it around amazingly. Uh, one of the things that's quite interesting is the sister ship, uh, the Philadelphia, is currently uh, on display at the American History Museum. So that's sort of a little tie in there. But one of the things that's uh, interesting on a conservation standpoint is after that time, uh, we do know that he put some coatings on uh, both the organic and inorganic objects. I'm not sure exactly when, uh, we don't have that uh, information, but uh, he did during that time period. After it was up, he actually had was disassembled sometime. Uh, it was kept in his barn. It had a very uh, lively uh, uh, storage situation for a while. Uh, but uh, moving into the 90s, uh, early 2000s, Paglin uh, was actually uh, 
sold it to the city of Harrisburg. And Harrisburg really wanted to set up a museum for these artifacts. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen and they put that up for auction. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky, uh, as I think Kate mentioned uh, regarding uh, some of the Terry Craft Act and some of the artifacts that are still government owned by the uh, When we saw that it was put up for bid, we were able to stop that sale and we worked with the city of Harrisburg to get these artifacts back to the Navy and working on starting to conserve them and get them back to a stable condition. Um, Kate, if you wouldn't mind that I'm trying, yeah, sorry, there we go, a little bit more, okay, I know we're going to, can't really see me, but I want you to focus a little bit more on the artifacts itself, so here we go. Um, hopefully y'all can all see this, I will lift it up and show you a couple of things. Um, so when they came to us, uh, they came to us in a state that, as you can see on this side, and then this artifact. They, uh, these are just the iron artifacts that I brought out. Uh, they had this under coating. There was a lot of corrosion um, happening underneath. Uh, so first of all, we had to establish what the coating was. So um, we worked with the uh, chemistry department, the Naval, uh, um, Naval Academy uh, in uh, Oh my goodness, Annapolis, sorry. Uh, and they were wonderful. Uh, we were able to have a, and we continue to have a good working relationship with them. Uh, through also, uh, we have an internship program that's through uh, Office of Naval Research Center that allows uh, interns that are interested in particular conservation all the way up to engineering. It, it really is a broad spectrum uh, to come uh, and internship through various labs in the Navy. And we were able to get in under that. And we had a really good intern focusing on finding out what this coding was. Uh, she uh, went to the Naval Academy, we were able to get some FTIR data. And uh, at first she was really battling with it. it was, the spikes were quite unique. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden we found some documentation that mentions slack. And then she started looking at some of the data that was present and finding out that it is SHLAC, age SHLAC at that. So that helped us to move forward. Uh, we use uh, ultraviolet light to help figure out first how much coding, if there is any. So when we put it under the light, it, it fluoresces uh, like a big blue green color and so uh and visually you can see it but then that really tells you how much is on after we do that we have found out that we needed to figure out a way to remove schlack methods uh, so we decided to start doing some testing and uh, we found that uh, immersion in a two percent sodium hydroxide solution uh varies from different uh different size objects, but uh, we started testing with fasteners from the Royal Savage. Uh, we have about two, over, a little over 200 fasteners, so we knew that we had a good test group to go by. Uh, with this collection, I should say, we have about 2,300 individual artifacts, uh, and most of it is iron, so that's why we wanted to focus mostly on this first. After removing that, we were able to uh, immerse it swelled the shellac off and was able to get down to the uh, layer that uh, had a lot of corrosion still left. Unfortunately, um, he didn't do much cleaning the green from the shellac. One other thing I did not bring up was also we test the, uh, the salinity of the artifacts. So we actually did some testing um, on various fasteners for um, how much salt it could be uh, still trapped in these, and because of the freshwater environment, there wasn't much, so we felt more comfortable moving forward uh, with that, I and mean, it was extremely low. So we decided to just move with the cleaning. Now, we do have some artifacts, and I'm going to bring up to you on my wonderful blue here. Uh, this is one that has been conserved. Um, and if y'all look right here, I don't know if you can see, but there is some cracking. This is a uh, kettle foot. And with those, we do know that they can't be immersed. Uh, so we had to find another way. 
to take care of them. We want to make sure that the surface is, you know, still intact after the immersion uh, in sodium hydroxide. So the other testing that we were doing was with a gel solvent. Uh, it's pretty much uh, ethylene with 50% uh, ethanol and 50% acetone, and it seems to be very effective. It does take a lot longer to remove, but it does uh, help with that. Uh, so we do have some procedures to move forward, which we are very excited about. But the other aspect is this corrosion layer. Uh, we do do electrolytic reduction, but only for cleaning. So that, uh, that method uh, we have used on the, uh, the cannonballs here because they are more sturdy uh, metal. Uh, if they were like a fragile uh, metal, such as these uh, kettle fragments, we stick with mechanical cleaning. Um, they just, we have more control, as you would know. Uh, after that, we do some tannic acid to for the incursion inhibitor and then either molten uh, microcrystal wax or an acrylate uh, coating, such as acrylate B72, seems to be the best. Uh, but the thing is, is now that we got this procedure, how to do this in a timely fashion, um, one of the things that's quite interesting, some of y'all may have heard, there is going to be a new uh, Navy Museum opening up at some time in the future. And one of the things that we would like to showcase is this uh, collection. So our focus is going to be working on this to get as much as we can stabilized um, and actually tell that story to about the Navy. Uh, that's one of the things that's quite interesting that we're working on. Again, we have to go through quite a few, so it's going to take a while, but uh, we're looking forward to seeing the results. The next thing I'd like to show, and if Kate would like to help again, I know you always cut off, sorry. <laughs> um, Okay, I think that's a little bit better. Uh, I still want y'all to focus more on the artifacts, not me. Um, I'm sorry if I move my hands too much. I'm going to move my group. So, the other thing I'd like to discuss with you um, is these are some of the conserved artifacts, but we are working on a larger scale, scale now with some of the cannon and uh, we have an anchor as well as a strut in the background. You can see here, uh, that's uh, some of our tanks that we have artifacts currently going through desalination. The two that I wanna focus on is from uh, the proposed revenge site uh, from the USS Revenge. It's around uh, 1812, uh, Rec site. Uh, Oliver Hazafari was doing some uh, scouting in that area and uh, ran uh, in oh, like uh, Rhode Island. Apologies, Rhode Island. Uh, and in that area, he was very close to the coastline. And during that time, he actually uh, uh, ran aground on a reef. And what happened was they were trying to lighten the load, as historical documents are saying. And to do that, they were, you know, cannon and a whole bunch of heavy other stuff that was on the uh, ship was uh, disposed. Uh, still didn't, didn't work, so he had to leave the ship. One interesting fact is that he uh, was court-martialed for that. So uh, if you lose the ship, you know, <laughs> you're kind of in trouble, uh, even though uh, he became pretty famous in the Navy later on. So it's an interesting story. So uh, we actually had some divers up in Rhode Island that helped uh, tell us a little bit more about this. And this is where our, our military craft act and just, you know, the idea of uh, preservation has gotten out. So these divers came to us and said, hey, we think we found this particular wreck. So we went out there in 2015. Um, our archaeologist, George, Dr. George Sports, went out there to do some surveying, got some magnetic kits, thought that was interesting. Then in 2017, he went out there again and he brought up a cannon, um, a six pounder. And the following year in 2018, he brought up a Kiranid. 
during that time, uh, we're going to focus a little bit more on the six pounder uh, because uh, that is where these interesting artifacts came from. So the six pounder uh, came up very concreted, of course. Uh, and uh, one of the things that dealing with uh, on a Navy base, everything that's ordnance related does have to be uh, examined by an EOD expert. And so this was actually examined before it was loaded on to travel here. And so it was deemed travel, uh, safe to travel and kept it as wet as possible as we were deconcreting it. Uh, using the air scribes, uh, as I was cleaning it, I started noticing some signs that this may be a little bit more challenging than we thought due to the possibility that it's loaded. The first signs I started seeing were, I don't know if you can see it very well, but uh, fragments of the tampon in the pore area. I mean, they're very little, but that is indicative of uh, something um, being kept dry. Uh, and so I was like, okay, we will move forward. Uh, using some tools, uh, the bore was actually somewhat concreted, and so we were actually able to get some of the concretion uh, removed. A little challenging, uh, but it worked. And then all of a sudden, and this is beautiful actually, uh, we found the first wad. Now the, the wad, I'm probably wondering more of the conservation uh, process that we did this. The the wads uh, were conserved as well as the textile was conserved by using the Troham, probably mispronouncing that method. Uh, it's based on a site in Norway. So uh, this, this guy, uh, I think that publications was done in 1996, but the guy did a couple of uh, experiments and found out that of 1% carbomethyl oxycellulose and then 5% uh, polyethylene glycol um, 400 and then a 2% glycol uh, glycerol uh, combination worked really well. So I started trying that out and it really did. The cohesion was great. The color was great. Uh, we did do some iron removal um, using a chelating agent, ammonium citrate. Uh, so uh, I was very pleased with this particular product on these artifacts. Uh, we freeze dried them and uh, the cohesion, as you noticed, as I was looking at that one, I kept it just as this going into the freeze dryer. So I was very, very um, pleased. Uh, but this was the first one that was found. And then we found this one. This is very interesting because when we pulled it out, you can see the divot inside where the cannonball was. And that was one of the things I was a little concerned about with the freeze drying, how that would do very well. Then the next thing is, and I've kept it in here, so, you know, because we're on a table, but the cannonball, um, similar to what we do um, with this, is to go through electrolytic reduction, tannic, and then um, a coating. Now, after we saw this cannonball in the pore, we had to stop. Uh, this is where we had to actually contact uh, Quantico EOD. Uh, NHAC has a uh, agreement with them. We also, uh, as you know, our collection is not just the archaeological part, but we also have a curator branch that has about 300,000 artifacts, and we're dealing with the Navy, so you're going to go into ordnance and weapons at some point. So we talked to them, and we were able to get... Uh, to go out there, as I think Kate mentioned with M1 Grand, this was at the same time. So we actually brought that out. Uh, I had to get the cannonball out. And as soon as I got that out, I had to step away. Um, we noticed then after we moved the cannonball, there was a third watt. That is going through conservation right now. So um, can't really see it. Uh, it's doing well, just to say that. Uh, and after that was pulled out, then we have to step away for the EOD to actually uh, do their uh, job of rinsing out any possible black powder. Uh, very good job. But during that time, some of the stuff that was coming out was, I mean, we were, I was actually shocked that anything was left. And I don't know if you could see this very well. I want to keep it, I want to keep it on the thing. But this is part of the uh, gunpowder bag that was left. Um, very interesting. I did save 
some samples to be tested for later, but I went through the same process that these two did and it turned out just, just as fabulous. So I was really pleased with that particular process on these. Um, after this was all removed, uh, we got the okay from EOD. They were, they said it was inert. We can take it back and it is now waiting for our move into a new place for uh, electrolytic reduction. Uh, it's still going through desalination in a 1% sodium hydroxide solution. So I just wanted to showcase some of the unique things that we're doing here and uh, open for questions, I guess. Can't see on this. All right, yeah, we do have some questions. I can, uh, I can start off. Uh, we have a question from Ariana Johnston. And the question is, um, were there mechanical cleaning options considered for the shellac iron and or um, was mechanical cleaning tested alongside chemical cleaning? It was, it was, uh, we actually used UV and I should have brought this up. So we were using the UV alongside and it, it was pretty good. It wasn't as effective as the solvent and the sodium hydroxide. That could be a possible like third. Um, treatment, but it did, it did take some more time to remove that shellac. It wasn't as effective as the other two. But we did, uh, we did um, mechanical cleaning with scalpels, dental picks, uh, and uh, it worked, but it wasn't as effective. Hopefully that answered your question. Uh, just a reminder for everyone um, viewing it to, if you have any other questions, please put it in the chats and we'll, we'll direct it to our speakers. Um, in the meantime, I did have a question, um, and it's sort of much more basic. Um, and it's more centered around, uh, I was wondering how large your staff and your team is, uh, considering, you know, the, the scope that Kate had presented uh, on, the, on, this, on, on the many multi-pronged uh, 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 nature of where you are. Yeah, we're, we're eight full-time employees. Um, Shauna and I are the only dedicated uh, conservators within our, our branch, so two. <laughs> well, I guess that follows up then. Who would you consider is um, your most common uh, collaborator uh, on these projects then, since it's just the two of you? Um, and uh, who do you work with most often? I mean, I would say probably maybe our most common um, uh, similar lab facility would be uh, United States Army's conservation folks. Um, they are um, Fort Belvoir, I believe, is, is where they're located. And so um, they have they've run into kind of similar challenges like we do. Um, but we've, we've collaborated with them on, on some conversations. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, I think probably they're there the closest parallel to sure. us for sure. Oh, thank you. Um, we have another question from Lauren Gottsleep. Uh, Gottsleep and it uh, says, um, what was the name of the first ship that was mentioned on the lab tour? Uh, it was the sister ship of the Philadelphia. Yes, it's the Royal Savage. The Royal Savage. The Royal Savage, yeah. yeah. Um, um, we, before it was renamed um, the Royal Savage by uh, the colonial Navy, it was the Brave Savage, Savage that the British called it. So it could be looked up either way. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have another question. Um, do you only work on U.S. sunken ships? And what if it's another country ship in U.S. territory? And do you collaborate with other countries uh, on either of these? Uh, we do work with uh, foreign entities, uh, especially if the shipwreck is in our waters. Um, we hope that they would uh, do the same capacity uh, going both ways. Uh, we have worked, uh, one that comes to mind and maybe Kate can say a little bit more about this is there a particular U-boat was uh, a diver actually went in and got some of the artifacts from the particular new boat and they worked we worked with the German attache and the German uh, government 
department and uh, they were okay for us to conserve it here and keep it here for them at the time being. But uh, that was that's a, one of the first things that comes to mind uh, as a good relationship we have with some of the foreign nations. Yeah, as we, we hope that other foreign nations recognize um, America's second military craft, we therefore also recognize any foreign second military craft in our waters that have been identified as such by their um, by their owners. Um, so yeah, um, uh, U-boats are, are quite common. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think that's only that's a good good one. Highlight. We have one more, I think, uh, from Kira Teeter. Um, before coral was established, how did the Navy approach conservation and preservation work? And was it contracted out or taken care of in-house by other staff? That's a good question. So before, uh, I know Kate probably mentioned this, uh, it didn't really start till uh, the CSS Alabama artifacts came in. So before that, they, it was mainly contracted out when needed, um, the curator branch took on most of the conservation and the curation at the time before the branch was uh, developed. Um, yeah, that's, but yeah, there are some times where that does happen. Yeah, and I, I believe there were um, some conservators assigned on detail, um, mm -hmm. kind of in the early days before um, there were full-time employees focused on archaeological conservation. There were other um, detailed employees uh, from uh, Mac Lab um, who really got, got things going and, um, and helped to get the lab up and running for sure. Uh, Excellent. Yeah, yeah, just last thinking. Yeah. Um, let's see if there's any more questions. Um, doesn't seem like it. Um, I was actually, this is more personal, it's just, do you guys get a chance to travel out to some of these sites? around the world or are you hunkered down in uh where you are now um not as often as we yeah, like, but yeah. <laughs> um i know uh this summer our colleagues got to do uh, quite a few surveying operations um in florida uh they went back to the uh the revenge site to do some more testing out there so um and sometimes we get to be a part of that uh but yeah we would like to expand that if possible. <laughs> of course. It uh, doesn't look like we have any more questions, but I just want to thank you both so much for your time and uh, for the presentation and the tour and talking about the work that you guys do and what you do at the National uh, History and Heritage Command. <laughs> Uh, and so thank you all to the our, um, our guests that have come to see this. And I don't know if Rachel wanted to say anything else. Um, I didn't have anything else, but thank you so much. This was wonderful. It was really great to actually get to see this space and see some of the objects that you've worked on. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, this has been a great opportunity. Please come visit. Yes, <laughs> anytime, please do. Great. Yeah. Yes, okay. thank you so much.